Hi. Hey. 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 I'm not known. <laughs> but I will get him. Okay. Thank you. You all ready? Yes, yes. we're ready. Okay. Hold on. The joke never gets old when I'm not doing it. Okay. Do you need me to can't listen for a second just to well, make sure you're cool? Yeah, I think. Uh, Hi. Hi. How, how are you, Dr. Chomsky? How are you? Uh, can you speak closer to the microphone? Okay, how are you? Okay, how about you? <laughs> thank you, thank you for accepting our invitation to Calte Dominguez Hills. Very glad to be with you. Good morning, Dr. Chomsky. I'm Yvonne Hans Valcázar. I'm a linguist here. I'm a professor of linguistics here, at the Department of Modern Languages. Welcome to California State University, Dominguez Hills, the most diverse university west of the Mississippi. Yeah. Woo. That's impressive. We're very excited to have you here with us today, and uh, we are very thankful that you have given us some of your valuable and busy time. What I would like to do now, introduce you to our student organization, Organización Latina Estudiantil, OLE, and the, some of the students will be asking you questions, and I would like them to come up. Isaiah Sagal. That's me, man. That's an honor. And Anthony, now we will be, we'll be asking you the questions today, and then we'll uh, hopefully um, maybe interchange some questions after you answer those questions. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Hi. All right. Good morning, Dr. Chomsky. Um, the first question that I have is, what can we as students do in the United States to impact policies that are implemented in the Latin American countries? Well, the United States is uh, a very powerful state, and its, its policies uh, have an impact, direct impact, on what happens elsewhere. They don't determine it but they certainly are influential. So one thing we can do is try to influence U.S. government policy. Uh, that's not insignificant. The other thing we can do is basically solidarity work. So uh, interaction among students internationally, uh, say if Chilean students are struggling for rights as they have been, uh, interaction with them can both support them and can give us, people like you, ideas about what could be done here. International solidarity is uh, a lot easier than it used to be. It was always significant, but uh, that's possible too. So I think there are kind of two avenues that you can pursue as students here. One is uh, laying the basis for influencing U.S. policy, which means educational organizational work, activist work of many kinds. And the other is uh, seeking connections with students in, from Mexico to Chile uh, and uh, seeing what kind of solidarity work you can do, how you can do things which will help them in their often very bitter struggles. Mexico is a dramatic case uh, and see what, and uh, I'm sure you'll find it's interactive their ideas and thoughts and actions can stimulate people here. Chilean student strike, for example, could, have, could be an impetus to do things here in connection with problems which have some similarity. Thank you for uh, your response. I uh, very appreciate it. Uh, another question that we have here uh, is, uh, can you give us your analysis uh, of the social movement of Latin America and the uh, assassination of uh, Berta Cáceres, who won the Goldman uh, Environment Prize and the arrest of Gustavo Castro uh, Soto. Thank you. Well, that was a really horrible event, unfortunately, not unanticipated. And there are 
pretty obvious aspects of it that are discussed by people here who know something about the situation and aren't uh, restricted by doctrinal constraints, but hasn't has barely been discussed in the main media. Uh, her murder uh, is a part of a, 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 a deep uh, uh, wave of uh, repression and violence, uh, which expanded in Honduras, which always had a pretty horrible history, but expanded substantially after the 2009 coup, uh, which threw out uh, uh, Mel Zelaya and uh, instituted a basically a military regime, which did kind of run an election, which uh, uh, was uh, legitimated by the United States, by President Obama, but almost by almost no one else. Uh, the U.S. government refused to call it a coup, which almost everyone else did, because that would have required cutting off military aid to the junta and the government it installed. And one of the effects of that was to turn Honduras into a real monstrosity uh, with a very uh, sharp increase in violence and repression. It became uh, the murder capital of the world for a while and still goes on. Attacks on human rights activists, environmental activists, uh, labor leaders, and almost anyone is fair game. Uh, in fact, as I'm sure you know, during the period of what is kind of ludicrously called the refugee crisis here, uh, for a time, the plurality, the largest number of uh, people fleeing to the United States were from Honduras uh, after the coup. Uh, these are people fleeing from the results of our policies. Actually, the same is true of people fleeing from Guatemala, to El Salvador, uh, also from Mexico, different policies. But in Honduras, it was particularly striking. And this particular murder is just one graphic and particularly disgraceful example of it. These are policies, going back to the previous question, uh, the, here's a perfect case where students, young people like you, can play a very significant role in trying to bring about general understanding of what is ha happening, uh, leading to a change in the kinds of policies that make these at kind of atrocities like these possible. It's not a unique case. So, for example, if you look over the years, you find uh, that U.S. military, in fact, I'll just quote one of the leading specialists, academic specialists on human rights in Latin America, Lars Schultz, University of North Carolina, uh, had an important article way back in 1980 in which he pointed out that uh, he studied uh, human rights violations in Latin America and U.S. aid, including military aid, and he found a very close correlation. He pointed out that, uh, this is an academic publication, he pointed out that U.S. aid, including military aid, uh, goes overwhelmingly to countries that have the most egregious uh, records of human rights violations. Uh, nobody has really tried to study it since 1980 for the simple reason that the correlation is so utterly overwhelming that there isn't even, it's not even an academic exercise to prove it. So in the 1980s, uh, the highest U.S. aid, mostly military aid, was going to El Salvador, which was the second highest uh, 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 center of uh, atrocities. The, the highest was Guatemala, and the only reason U.S. aid wasn't going there, though Reagan, President Reagan, tried to send it there, is because Congress put barriers against it. So the U.S. had to turn to client states to provide the military aid and training, primarily Israel, uh, also Taiwan, a couple of others, Saudi Arabia funded it. So we just had terror states carrying it out. But El Salvador was direct U.S. aid, and maybe 70,000 people killed by mostly the armed forces supported by the United States. Uh, that went on until 19, 
roughly until the peace agreement, roughly 1990. At that point, Colombia took first place, uh, had the worst record of the worst human rights record in the hemisphere by far, and it was by far the leading recipient of U.S. military aid. And so it continues. Uh, Honduras today is another case. Uh, actually, there was uh, a very interesting study done in the early 1980s by uh, Edward Herman. He's an economist at the uh, uh, un work in school at the University of Pennsylvania, co-author, and we've worked together often on articles and books. Uh, he, uh, he did a study also of uh, three things, hu uh, human rights atrocities, U.S. aid, including military aid, and changes in the business climate, the climate for investment. You know, is it better for investors and so on? Are there repatriation of profits and so on? What he found is a very close correlation between U.S. aid, military aid, and improvements in the business climate. Well, that makes sense. Not pretty, but it makes sense that the United States is fundamentally trying to improve the climate for U.S. investors and for uh, the business world and so on. Uh, then there's a secondary correlation between improvements in the business climate and human rights violations. And that's understandable too. Uh, one of the best ways to improve the business climate, climate for investment, is to murder human leaders, uh, union activists, uh, uh, destroy the labor movement, uh, kill human rights activists, and so on. That improves the business climate. So it turns out that there's a, 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 a secondary correlation between U.S aid, military aid, and human rights violations. So it's not that U.S. Uh, leaders love torture, they just don't care one way or another, but the kinds of things they do love, like improving the business climate, do lead to torture and assassination and so on. Now that's a, uh, that's an ex a serious explanation of the correlation that Lars Schultz and others have found. Uh, and I think one should bear that in mind. That's the same is true in the Honduras case. This goes way back, and uh, it's a very ugly picture. Thank you uh, for your very uh, detailed answer. Um, another question that we have um, is, uh, do you consider uh, Mexico to be a failed state in uh, about the 43 students in uh, Yotinapa, uh, what's your op opinion about it? Thank you. Well, the murder of the 43 students was a major atrocity, of course, and it's just magnified by the failure to carry out a serious investigation. And it's presumed, I think, pretty plausibly that the reason for that failure is that uh, those in power don't want the facts to be exposed. The chances are very strong that the massacre had uh, uh, direct involvement of uh, at least the police, maybe the military, maybe higher state authorities. Uh, is Mexico a failed state? Well, that's a question that you have to look at very, I mean, there's a lot of things wrong in Mexico, but take a look at them and see what they are. So, for example, Mexico is uh, substantially in the hands of violent and murderous drug cartels. Uh, that's a pretty serious problem in Mexico, very serious. Uh, it's uh, for many quite obvious reasons. But uh, why are there drug cartels in Mexico? Uh, I mean, is it because Mexico wants drug cartels? Are there drug cartels in Mexico because of the U.S. drug war? Uh, the U.S. is the source of demand, and it's also the source of supply. So actually, a majority of the weapons that are used for murders by the drug cartels in Mexico, a majority come from the United States. Uh, that's because of uh, very lax uh, regulations in the United States, particularly in the, the, the border states near Mexico, which make it really easy for, you know, say, you or me, 
uh, to go into a store and buy a couple of assault rifles and hand them over to the, the guy from the uh, Mexico cartel, take them across the border and they'll be used to murder somebody. Uh, so the source of the problem is really here. Does that make Mexico a failed state or does that make us a failed state? Uh, why do we have uh, a drug war altogether? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, it's been known for, I mean, there are drug problems, undoubtedly. It's been known for years uh, that, there are, uh, that there are good ways, that there are helpful and constructive ways to solve them. And there are other ways that just don't work. Which is a famous study a long time ago, probably in the 80s, by the Rand Corporation. That's a Pentagon related research organization uh, using government data very close to the Pentagon. Uh, what they found is that uh, they studied three methods for uh, dealing with uh, uh, addiction. Uh, the, one, the, uh, the method that worked best best results and the cheapest, so the most cost-effective, was uh, prevention and treatment. Nothing forceful. Prevention and treatment was the best method. Things like clean needles and uh, educational programs and so on. Uh, the second method was uh, border control, trying to block drugs at the border. That was more expensive and less effective. And the third, which was the worst of all, uh, least effective and most expensive, was what they call out-of-country operations. That means things like uh, fumigation in Colombia. Fumigation is a nice word, which really means chemical warfare, uh, which uh, destroys land, drives campesinos off the land, destroys crops. That's one of the main reasons why Colombia, which is, should be a rich, prosperous country, is um, the most violent country in the hemisphere and uh, has the largest uh, displaced persons population in the world, actually, outside of Afghanistan. People are just driven, campesinos, indigenous people, just driven off the land, a lot of it by U.S. chemical warfare. So take a look at the, and those are the basic facts. If you take a look at the policies, they're the opposite. The least effort least, practically very little, is given to what works best and is cheapest, prevention and treatment. Uh, more efforts are given to border control. You know, if you're Donald Trump, you build a wall and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, and the, and the uh, heavy, really extensive efforts are given to, uh, 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 to out-of-country operations, the ones that work that do the least and are the most expensive. Now, furthermore, over 40 years of these policies, it has had essentially no effect on drug use. You can measure that by, say, the price of um, heroin in the streets of New York. Doesn't change, you know, a little bit up and down, but unaffected by the policies. Uh, another aspect of the policies. So you have to ask yourself, what's going on? I mean, are the people imbeciles? You know, they can't see that... Uh, they're following the least effective, most expensive policies and it's having no effect. Of course they can see. That leads one to suggest, to suspect right away that there are other goals, which has nothing to do with drugs. Uh, and incidentally, Mexico is collateral damage. They're the ones who suffer from it, Colombia and Bolivia, other uh, The goals, the effects in the United, and to find out the, uh, the goals, what you look at is the uh, consequences and the predictable and very visible consequences. So the consequence within the United States is to put a huge part of the mostly black, partly Hispanic male population in jail. Uh, the incarceration rate has gone way up during the drug war. Go back to 1980, U.S. incarceration was roughly the level of other industrial countries. It's skyrocketed since then. Crime hasn't increased, in fact, it's declined, and a huge portion of it is victimless crimes, uh, people who are picked up for drugs. That's one consequence, and that, I think, is related to changes in the economy, which have undermined the prospects for 
decent jobs, led to a kind of superfluous population, people who can't get, say, work in the auto plants and so on. And what do you do with them? You throw them in jail. It's primarily uh, the minorities, black population. It's horrible in the African-American population. It's bad enough in the uh, Latino, Hispanic populations. Now, you take a look at the uh, chemical warfare and uh, say in Colombia, fumigation in Colombia, it's not having any effect on drugs, it's very expensive, but what it's doing is dry, is clearing lands, driving literally millions of people off the land into slums around Bogota, uh, opening those regions for the mining, uh, you know, ranches for the super elite, uh, uh, and so on, uh, and that's uh, um, that's the effect of the uh, of the uh, of the policies. Well, as I said, Mexico is collateral damage. Uh, Colombia is collateral damage. They're the ones who are suffering. So, are they the failed states? In fact, the Latin American countries understand this. And one of the really dramatic developments in the last ten or fifteen years is that Latin America has. Finally, after 500 years of subordination to imperial powers, last century mostly the U.S., has begun to extricate itself. By now, Latin America no longer follows orders. Uh, this became very clear uh, at the uh, uh, hemispheric summit in Cartagena, I think it was 2012, where uh, no decisions could be reached because the United States and Canada were isolated. There were two major issues. One issue was admitting Cuba into the hemisphere. Uh, the entire, all of Latin America was in favor of it, the whole hemisphere. The U.S. and Canada refused, so they couldn't reach a decision. The second issue was the drug war. Uh, the entire hemisphere outside the U.S. and Canada wanted to change the U.S policies, uh, the punitive, harsh policies, which are having no effect on drug use, uh, on addiction, but are having terrible effects in, the, in, in, in all the countries, including here with incarceration, but much worse in Mexico and uh, Colombia and so on. So the entire hemisphere wanted to change it. The U.S. and Canada refused. Uh, that's, uh, so who's the failed state? That's the question we ought to be asking. Uh, thank you for your response. Uh, our following question is, if Donald Trump wins the presidential election and becomes president, how do you think that would affect the relationship between the United States and Latin American countries? <laughs> <laughs> well, you first have to ask a que first question is, does Donald Trump mean anything that he says? Or does he even understand what he's saying? <laughs> That's not a very tough and serious question. He's a con man, uh, you know, like a guy in a circus. Uh, he just says whatever comes to his head and whatever he thinks will arouse the audience. So you really don't know what he means, if he means anything. But, you know, the, but if, you take, if you assume that he means some of the things that he says, then the relations with the rest of the world are just going to be uh, indescribable. Uh, that's why most of the world is kind of terrified at the spectacle that's going on in the United States. There's, in the history of parliamentary democracies, there's just been nothing like this uh, spectacle, a farce that's called the Republican primaries. So start with uh, building a wall, uh, uh, to block off uh, the, the Mexicans who are sending their uh, rapists and murderers and criminals to the United States, and of course they're sending drugs to the United States, and of course get Mexico to pay for the wall because he's a good negotiator. I mean, how can you even comment on this? I mean, it's, I mean, you can point out that it's not even technically feasible, but that's not really the point. It's utterly grotesque. I mean, who are those? refugees who are keeping out, uh, mostly victims of our policies. 
uh, wired drugs coming in. Yeah, because we have the demand and provide the uh, uh, most of the weapons. Uh, and it just goes on like that. He hasn't had a lot to say about the rest of Latin America, but uh, it'd be pretty awful. And the same with others. Uh, uh, what do you do with uh, China? You stop them from cheating us by negotiating a better deal. And how? Um, we don't say. Actually, the worst thing about Trump is not this. The worst thing about Trump, and in fact, every single Republican candidate, is that they are taking a position on the most crucial issue that we face, which is utterly disastrous. We, you, are a generation that has to make a, a, a decision of really incredible importance. There's been nothing like it in the history of the human species. You have to decide whether the species want to continue to survive at any moderately decent level. And that's an imminent prospect, an imminent prospect. I'm turning up talking about the threat of environmental catastrophe, which is very real and very imminent. Uh, the level of sea level rise now is highest it's been in 2,000 years. Uh, the average level of uh, warming, global warming, is the highest it's been in all of geological history. Uh, this is coming very fast, and it's going to be, if it continues, it will be a catastrophe of just indescribable proportions. So what do the Republican candidates say? Either they say, like Trump, it's not happening, or some of them say, well, maybe it's happening, but we can't do anything about it, we shouldn't do anything about it. Well, it's worth for virtually a death knell for the species. Uh, and they're acting that way too. It's not a joke. Like in Paris last December, there was an international conference, an important one, which was trying to set some international standards for dealing with uh, the, the, the catastrophic threat of climate change. They were hoping to get a treaty, a, a verifiable treaty that countries would commit themselves to. They couldn't for a very simple reason the Republican Congress. Republican Congress made it very clear they would never accept a verifiable treaty. Uh, so therefore, the most that could be reached was uh, voluntary agreements, not very good ones, and voluntary agreements can of course be, uh, uh, be violated. And it gets worse. The uh, five, after Scalia's death, four uh, reactionary members of the Supreme Court went way out of their way, violating precedent to essentially block mild uh, government efforts to regulate coal plants. That's a message to the world. It says, get lost. We're not going to let you do it. We're not going to do anything. And if we don't do anything, of course, why should you do anything? So where, what about Donald Trump? Well, he's in the lead. He says, it's not happening. So forget it. They'll take care of it. And it goes on like that. Uh, he's, he's really unpredictable uh, because um, if you look at his positions, some of them are actually kind of reasonable. Uh, some are off the wall. Uh, you don't know which one will come out next. And putting a person like that in a position of enormous power, in fact, power to set off nuclear war, for example, which is terminal, it's a really frightening prospect. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, a couple of years ago, there, there are international polls run by U.S. polling agencies, Gallup Poll, which ask, among other questions, uh, one of the questions they ask is, which country is the gravest threat to world peace? Uh, the United States is overwhelmingly in the lead. No other country is even close. That was a couple of years ago. Just imagine what it's like now and for good reasons. Those are the problems that people like you are going to have to face. Thank you again for uh, your uh, very uh, insightful, detailed response uh, to this question. Uh, the following question that we have is, uh, what, are, what are going to be the effects of the transatlantic free uh, trans 
agreement in the econ economies of Latin America. Thank you. Well, the first thing we should do is uh, have uh, insist on uh, truth in advertising. Uh, there is no free trade agreement. There is not a single free trade agreement. Not NAFTA, not the World Trade Organization, the Uruguay Round, and certainly not the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. These are not free trade agreements. For one thing, they are highly protectionist. They have levels of protectionism that have never been true in the past, literally. The level of patent protection uh, is designed to ensure that U.S. and also foreign pharmaceutical corporations will make exorbitant profits and that drugs will be way more expensive than they ought to be and that media conglomerates will again make huge profits. Uh, if regulations like that had been in place in the past when the U.S. was a developing country, uh, the U.S. would right now be exporting uh, fur and uh, fish and wouldn't have an economy, uh, literally. Uh, so that's the first point. Second point is not only are these not free trade agreements, they're not even trade agreements, literally, just like NAFTA. A lot of the provisions have nothing to do with trade. You know, they have to do with investor rights. So, for example, there are provisions in the TPP, just like NAFTA, uh, that say that if some, say, you know, a corporation, let's say an American corporation, that doesn't like uh, the fact that Mexico is uh, setting up an environmental protection zone, it can sue Mexico under NAFTA. In fact, it's happened, uh, saying you're taking away our future profits because we intended to uh, build a gold mine there. You can do that under the TPP. Now, what does that have to do with trade? And these suits, incidentally, don't go to anything like transparent courts. They go to uh, trade panels made up of uh, uh, representatives of business. But it goes on like that. These are investor rights agreements. Uh, and uh, what is the purpose? What's going to be the effect on Latin America? Like the effect of other such agreements. It'll enrich some people, it'll harm others. So take, say, NAFTA, which is kind of the model. Uh, NAFTA has harmed, uh, let's just, it's harmed American workers, it's harmed Canadian workers, it's also harmed Mexicans. Uh, one of the reasons for the, uh, the flight of people from Mexico to the United States is NAFTA. Uh, Mexican campesinos can't possibly compete with highly subsidized U.S. agribusiness, impossible. So they're driven off the land, can't produce corn where Mexico comes from. Uh, and uh, what do they do? Well, many of them just uh, try to get to the United States to survive. And then we build walls to, to drive them away. Uh, those are the kinds of, and this continues. Another large part of the TPP is to try to build a system which will uh, be under U.S. control and separate from the regions of Chinese influence. So China is crucially excluded from it, and the United States, almost alone, refuses to take part in the Chinese-based uh, Asian Development Bank. Uh, that's geostrategic planning, which Latin America is caught up in. So I think uh, we can expect the uh, effects to be pretty harmful. And I, I'm sorry, I just got a note saying that I've got another appointment coming and we're already a bit over, so sorry for talking too long. I'll have to leave. Thank you, Chomsky. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> The gentleman who was here before, uh, do a documentary film. The link to all the comments on the public.